good afternoon. Um, it's, it's great to be here with you, and I think quite an interesting discussion we can have. So I will go through the presentation a little bit more quickly. I think the opportunity for us here is that uh, we have the ability to direct investments uh, to a place uh, where we can do good for the world. What I'd like to talk through with you on today is the just energy transition and really talking about uh, north and south, traditional versus new forms of energy and public and private sector. And notice I'm using the word and and not versus because I believe that these two elements need to come together. So I'm not going to go through a narrative on the energy transition. I think you all are very familiar with much of that. But what I would like to do is to put in front of us some facts and some opportunities, um, keeping with the spirit of the transition overall. The first thing I have to say is that we need to move quickly. We need to move quickly, and I think there is capital that needs to move quickly also. If we look at the last transitions that have happened, these transitions have moved at a pace that was about half, I would say, the pace that we need to move at. To go through from uh, where we are today to, gr to low carbon energy and to meet our net zero goals, we really need to do that in about 15 to 25 years. If we look back, what you will see is that uh, the conversion to coal took us 55 years, the conversion to oil took us 35 years. So we're essentially moving at more than double the speed than any other transition had moved at in the past. So I think we appreciate and take that opportunity to uh, 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 take that fact to guide us as we move forward. Now, the first element is around energy um, and society. What we have seen, and uh, you probably are quite aware of this, is that prosperity is very much linked to energy access. And if you take a look at the chart, you'll see a couple of things here. First is that there is a very strong correlation between energy access, so you're looking at the line if you're following the dots, between energy access and the level of human prosperity. And human prosperity here is being measured by some very basic elements, lifespan, access to education, and GDP overall. The second thing that we note is that societies that have access to less than 20 megawatt hours per annum, per capita, always struggle to be high on the human prosperity index. Okay? And I, I hope that you can all imagine where your countries are, where you're coming from. But what I think is most telling to us right now is the fact that not only are we dealing with a large number of countries and a large part of the population that does not have sufficient access, it's that we still have 775 million people globally without access to energy. So this frames a little bit why we wanted to talk about not the energy transition, but the just energy transition overall. So as we go through this, the presentation and then hopefully the discussion, what we would like to talk about is uh, sustainable, affordable, and secure access to energy. Now, we're at the FII and we're talking about investments. So I do want to start with the fact that we, we know the solutions that are going to get us to a net zero world. And simply, if we think about the 50 around gigatons that needed to be reduced, uh, to get to net zero, the technologies that we need to be investing in now, um, and if we believe that we will get momentum on the transition overall around energy efficiency. So energy efficiency looking at how do we invest in insulation of buildings, how do we accelerate smart meters, and I think fundamentally, how do we change behavior, how do we change demand behaviors overall? And I think demand, if you're following with me, is one of those elements that has been, in many ways, untapped. And I'm speaking about industrial demand, and I'm speaking about individual demand. From an industrial demand perspective, and we were at a forum, uh, a Chatham House forum, about two weeks ago, 
talking to some of the power companies about their industrial customers, and not enough is done to do load balancing within cities. So there is a huge opportunity for us there. Second, we want to talk about uh, um, electrification of end use. We, we, we have all been talking about electric vehicles, heat pumps, electric furnaces. Third, we talk about decarbonization of the power supply. Um, we need to see more solar, onshore wind, and power. And I think when we're at COP28 in a, the next month or two, we will see hopefully quite a bit of commitment going behind those uh, investments overall. Third, um, low carbon fuels, which you're familiar with. And then really carbon capture, because we recognize that for many of us, um, corporates and countries that are looking at the abatement curve, this part of the abatement curve tends to be more easily investable. What we need to think through is with the risk that is associated with technologies that are less mature, like carbon capture, how do we accelerate point source capture, direct air capture, and different things? So, message again being, we know the technologies that will get us to a more sustainable energy supply. The reality is, and I was emphasizing a couple of minutes ago this point on demand management, um, what we see and what we know is because of the technologies that we have, because of the way that we use electricity today, about 67% of primary energy input um, is lost. What we also know at the same time, and, and I think this is a huge opportunity for us, the second point as we think through managing energy demand is that we think about that linear curve. The linear curve where in the past, we have said increasing energy consumption has been correlated with higher HDI, a, a stronger human development index. And I think that is a relationship that we need to break. And what we're seeing is that uh, the gradient of that curve is actually coming down because we are able to do better and to prosper with less energy over time. The world in general um, is coming down at a level of uh, one third of the energy uh, per GDP that is needed overall. So where are we now? We appreciate that we can do more with less, that we need to be more efficient with our energy sources. We appreciate that it is also important for us to invest in some of the more obvious technologies. And I think the point here, without maybe going too far into the slide, is also appreciating that we need to distribute investments across the value chain. What we're observing is that there is not enough investment in electricity grids globally. So there is a significant amount of investment that is moving towards solar and wind capacity as we work towards uh, um, uh, building up that generation capacity. But what we find is that the grids are falling behind, the grids are not ready, and we actually have queues waiting to get onto these grids. So when we talk net zero, we love to focus on green energy. And there is, uh, in some ways, a demonization of oil and gas. As we think through, and I want to bring this back to investments consistently because this is the theme of the forum. As we think through the investments, we must recognize that oil and gas is going to continue to play a critical part of our energy supply moving forward. In almost every scenario that you look at. So what does that mean? It means that we need to actively create the conditions and direct the investments that will allow us to produce the lowest cost, the lowest carbon, oil and gas possible. Because if we don't direct the investments, what we end up having is a spike in energy costs, and then we lose the affordability and security of supply. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to make a couple of points around 
how we think about some of the challenges that will be faced going forward. And I've highlighted one here that is around transportation costs. Because we th when we think through affordability, affordability is not only around the cost of generation or the cost of transmission, but there are some critical factors as we think through technology development and uh, the cost of transportation for many of the energy sources that we're dealing with overall. Good. So the, the theme of this talk, if we go back now, was north versus south. It was uh, private versus uh, um, public. We see that there are four key geographies that are key to success um, uh, as we move towards a net zero world. China, India, US, and Europe need to come to the table in a meaningful way. They are controlling over 60% of emissions overall. In addition, um, we recognize that countries like uh, China is leading, and I'm, I'm going to show you, the re I'm, I'm prepping this to show you some of the risks that we're going to experience going forward. So China is a leader in low carbon manufacturing. Uh, so they're capitalizing and they're investing and they're de deriving the value from the transition overall, whereas uh, they are still have a meaningful proportion of coal within their, their, their overall value chain. So we need to be able to influence countries so that while they invest in clean tech and innovation, that they're able to reduce coal demand internally to boost the pace of the transition overall. The risk that we see um, beyond this is that the supply chains for some of the critical products that we need are first quite concentrated and in limited supply. So for those of you that are investing in batteries, in EVs and different capacities, we see that many of our critical minerals are coming from very finite sources where we have limited control and access as we progress over time. I, I, I let this point rest with you for a moment. As we think through the supply chain risks, some of what is important is to acknowledge that geopolitics is also becoming much more difficult to both predict and incorporate into both private and public sector plans. Supply chain shifts are happening overall um, uh, from China to ASEAN, leading to more US ASEAN growth. We also see that there are internal divisions even within singular countries about uh, geopolitical relationships uh, across countries. I mean, we just to, to, to call out sort of the main point here is that it's very difficult to predict what's going to be happening going forward in terms of geopolitics. And then if I go back, and then the movement of these critical goods as they come into short supply. What we're seeing, especially as I deal with many of my own clients, is that that means there is going to be more localization and regionalization of supply chains going forward. So as much as possible, end-to-end -end value chain from mining of minerals, and we're seeing that already even here within Saudi Arabia, but in many countries globally, straight through to the manufacturing of materials, even though it may not be as cost competitive at the moment, many countries are investing so that they can manage this risk and secure their own um, energy supply going forward. The risks of the supply chain, I think, uh, are accentuated by a couple of other factors that we're seeing at the moment. The higher cost of capital is making it more difficult for us to finance the transition as we move forward. And we're seeing that with a lot of projects at the moment that were quite marginal. Second, and I'm going to go into this, this particular point a little bit further on as we talk about the impact of developed and developing countries. The LNG spot market, we see that over 50% of LNG spot cargoes today are being purchased by European countries. This is leading to shortages in the global south, and it's also leading to implications 
on how they purchase, their, how they generate and purchase their own energy. Before I go into to the point on the balancing and implications of North versus South, I do want to recognize that over time, investing in low carbon energy supply will have significant benefits for us on uh, um, sustainability. And I'm taking here one example, which can be translated to many other countries globally. So for every gigawatt of wind that is deployed in the North Sea, what we see is that from a sustainability perspective, we are able to mitigate the emissions relative to fossil fuels by 1.5 to 4 million tons. From an affordability perspective, we reduce supply costs by 350 to 400 million. And from a security perspective, we're able to reduce imports by 10 equivalent <coughs> LNG cargoes overall. And this is great. But the reality is a lot of these developed countries are able, um, uh, uh, able to afford to make these moves. Some of the second and third order effects of what we see um, in one region intensifies the ability of developing countries or that intensifies the challenges that developing countries face when they try to move with us on the net zero journey. And this is why that balancing of investments and that, let's say, interconnectivity between money flows, skill flows need to happen. If we look at the, 20, the 2022 energy crisis, fossil fuel prices, as you know, rose quite sharply and power prices did. So what happened? A lot of the developed countries secured the energy supply and we saw a 34% increase in renewables capacity. We saw two times faster expected renewable capacity growth in um, Europe. But at the same time, we saw that almost all of the LNG spot market was secured by Europe. What then was the implication? The implication was that developing, many developing economies then had to choose between security, energy security, and a lower carbon footprint. So Pakistan, and I want us to go through some specific examples so that we make this quite real. So Pakistan, we see, had a four times increase in coal-fired capacity after losing trust in the reliability of their LNG supply. Two-thirds of the LNG that Bangladesh typically used became unavailable during the crisis, then lead it to blackouts. So, so you see why, in some ways, from a Pakistani perspective, it made sense. Zimbabwe had lower than expected GDP growth. 3.5% versus 8.5% in 2021 due to insufficient access to affordable energy. So there is interconnectivity that I think we need to be managing overall um, between these flows. And it comes back to when we invest, when we go to forums at COP, when we talk about loss and damage funds, this is why it's important. I'm not going to go into the cost of capital. Um, you can take a snapshot here if you want, but I think the main point is that uh, in the current environment, uh, signals are that we're getting a lot more investment in oil and gas, which is okay. Um, but we need to think about uh, the investment of, uh, uh, in renewable power grids and utility grids overall. So, so maybe as we bring this to closure, a couple of things, and focusing the last part of the discussion on, well, what needs to be done and what needs to be done across the various stakeholder groups. First, uh, policymakers. I think there is a gap that needs to be closed between uh, green products and gray products. Uh, because by driving demand for green products, uh, we will accelerate the business uptake. So this is thinking through incentives, subsidies, IRA equivalents, CBAM equivalents uh, that can go into place uh, to make green products uh, much more competitive. 
energy markets need to be redesigned. They need to be redesigned to promote the right behaviors. We need to accelerate planning and permitting, and especially for the developed countries, I think planning and permitting around transmission and distribution. So policies. Second, and I think policies is where, if you were to ask me, we need to see more happening much faster to drive the entire um, stakeholder group forward um, and to, to move the transition at a much faster pace. Second, we have large energy consumers and infrastructure producers. Um, and here it's really around locking in the green supply chain, driving um, and investing in their abatement curves and focusing on low carbon uh, ecosystems overall. Energy producers and suppliers, so continuing to invest at the right pace in fossil fuels so that we can have the security leading the charge into low carbon energy production and CCUS. I think we need to see CCUS and direct air capture moving a bit faster than it is today. Developing um, region specific uh, energy portfolios because of this point on security, regionalization and localization. Um, and planning for volatilities and not looking you know, at how to overlook it overall. I'm gonna skip, um, so OEMs, I think supply chain solution providers really around de-risking and diversifying dependencies. So for looking for new materials, new products, so that we can decouple a bit from any specific company, entity overall. Scale, driving for scale so that we can come down that experience curve and continuing to balance innovation and standardization, which I think is a key challenge for many of our manufacturers today that are looking to go at scale. And then finally, um, from an investment perspective, I think engaging in discussions to install long-term investment signals to complement the market. What we're seeing when we deal, deal with a lot of funds today because of the risk appetite, there's a lot of capital that is going into more large capital risk than there an insufficient capital going into higher risk technologies overall. So that redistribution needs to happen. Um, consistently integrating carbon into decision making. So thinking through carbon prices, carbon markets, and applying a very pragmatic approach um, to financing beyond project financing into more um, company level financing for low carbon technologies. So what I would like to do is maybe end where I started. The task that we have ahead of us is one like no task that we have experienced before when it comes to energy transitions. We need to move two to three times faster than the transition to coal two to three times faster than the transition to oil and gas. And it can only happen if we put the, cap the capabilities, the investments behind it, and if our governments are steered to have the right policies and regulations to move all stakeholder groups. So with that, we have two or three minutes um, overall, and I would welcome any comments, reactions, or questions from the group that's with us today. And I think we have time for maybe two, two thoughts from you. No? Very good. Well, thank you for coming today. It's great to see the engagement that we have had in terms of participation in the presentation. And I think my last urge is that we go back to whichever stakeholder group that we're dealing with um, to think through how can we move further faster? Thank you very much for your time today.